This morning we are looking at a text in 1 Corinthians 15, so if you would please turn there in your Bibles. I'd like to read a few of the verses here, verses 20 through 27. I've already um, told you what the, um, the text is we're looking at, and that is verse 25. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 27. Would you listen carefully as I read this? This is God's Word. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now, last week, you recall, we saw three very important things that I hope, by God's grace, will shape the direction of our lives. The first thing we saw is that our whole reason for living should be wrapped up in the kingdom of God. Now, it should be because this is God's whole purpose for everything that he has done in this world. It's his reason that he created the world in the first place, the reason why he made you and me and really everyone else, the reason why he redeemed us. He did all these things that he might give glory to his son and in doing so might magnify his grace and his mercy. So that next time you think about what it is that you want to do with your life, what it is you, you should do, you do need to remember the Lord tells you whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything that you do should in some way advance the reason for your existence, which is to promote the kingdom of heaven. So in your callings, make sure that you are doing what God calls you to do in a way that brings glory to Him, that you're doing the right thing. Make sure you're also praying that the Lord might advance His kingdom and that He might also use you to evangelize. The second thing that we saw was this, that you should draw your self-worth from this work of redemption. This is one thing that as Christians, I hope we don't struggle with, although I know we probably do along with the, the, uh, the rest of the world, sadly. We struggle with self-worth. We struggle with self-esteem, at least in a certain sense we do. I, I think we understand there's a way of understanding that, which, which basically says I think more highly of myself than I ought to because I'm not finding the things that I think I should find, that I should find worth in so that I can see myself as something that's valuable. You see, we're not supposed to be finding our self-worth within ourselves because basically the Bible says we're sinners. Even Abraham was reckoned as one who was dug from a pit. God didn't choose him because he was so sterling. He actually chose him in, that he might make him to be a good man. God doesn't choose us on that basis. There is nothing good in us. We can't find uh, self-worth or, or our, our reason for for finding value within ourselves at all from ourselves. We actually need to find it in the work of redemption, the fact that Jesus set his affection on us and that he loved us, and that he came into the world to die for us, the fact that he finds us to have some value. That's where we should find our value. So that's the second thing that, that we saw last week. Thirdly, that you and I should constantly be seeking the Lord for revival. That's what I'm hoping we're going to be seeing throughout this month. Because this is one of the most powerful ways that God actually brings about the gathering in of His Son's reward. And considering the first point, which is that that is your purpose and my purpose for existence, 
that Jesus Christ be glorified in the work of redemption, we should be praying that he would be glorified and we should be seeking to advance this work of revival by seeking the Lord for it. And so you should pray, I should pray, that God would bring revival so that this work would advance. Now this morning we're going to look at another reward that Jesus receives, another work that is boosted by revival, and that is the subjection, the conquering of all of his enemies. By the way, his enemies are your enemies, and they're my enemies, and they're God's enemies. The fact that they're going to be subdued is a good thing. And this subjection, of course, is a good thing. Would to God that everyone in the world would bow the knee willingly to Jesus and receive him as Lord and Savior because it is for their good. Without him, they're going to perish. Now, the Bible says that all of Jesus' enemies are actually going to be subdued before he comes again. And that's really, uh, again, a matter of interpretation. But I do think scriptures bear that out that it will happen in this life. Now, all Christians agree, I and mean, they can't help but agree, if the Lord says that's what He's promised His Son, that that's actually going to happen, all Christians agree that it is going to happen someday. But many people believe it's going to be at the final judgment. Basically, if, if one didn't submit to Jesus in this life, that they will submit to Him on that day of judgment. I mean, they can't do otherwise. They have to submit especially to the sentence that he will pronounce against them. Everlasting condemnation and damnation for their sins because they would not receive his life. Now certainly on that day, everyone is going to be in subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ, but our text seems to indicate that that subjection is going to come about before the final judgment, that it's going to happen in this life. Jesus is reigning now, and the Bible says, Paul writes, he must continue to reign until all his enemies are put under his feet. As Paul told us already in Philippians chapter 2, every knee shall bow. This happens before the final judgment. So here's another reason why revival is so important, because it not only helps us to gather in Christ's people to safety, to save them from the final judgment, but it also speeds up the surrender of his enemies. So this morning, let's consider two things. First of all, that Jesus, as a reward for the work of his redemption, is given the rule over the entire world with the promise that all of his enemies will be subdued under his feet. They will all be subject to him. And then secondly, let's, we'll consider briefly that revival moves that work forward in the same way that it, it moves forward the work of gathering his sheep. So first of all, let's consider that the Father has exalted Jesus over the entire world with the promise that all of his enemies will be subjected to him. Now, first of all, there's no question that Jesus is now king of heaven and earth. The author to the Hebrews tells us that it was after his ascension that our Lord Jesus Christ was exalted to the right hand of God. It was after he died for our sins and after he was raised again from the dead, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Now, what does it mean that Jesus sat down at the right hand of God? I think you know by now that this was the day of his exaltation. This was the day of his coronation. This is when he was crowned king over all creation, at least when it was formally recognized by heaven. And certainly earth is called upon to recognize that same thing. But that was the day. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, verses 20 through 22, the Father seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, and authority, and power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. 
Now, didn't Jesus himself say uh, at the Great Commission, when he gave the commission to his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So many people in the church today look at these passages and they say, Jesus, when he comes again, is going to set up a kingdom that's going to last for a thousand years on the earth, and then Jesus will reign, but not until then. But I hope you see that Jesus, when he was raised from the dead and ascended to heaven, sat down at the right hand of God. He was placed above all authority and power, and he is ruling and reigning now. He says in the Great Commission, all authority has been given to me, which means it's happened and it continues. It's not something that is future. It's something that is past. That's why Jesus is called in Scripture, by the way, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, because that is, in fact, what he is. And this is exactly what the Lord said would happen through the prophet Daniel when he ascended into heaven, hundreds of years before it actually happened, gives us a clear picture of what went on on that day. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. I hope you can see the imagery here. When Jesus ascended into heaven, how did he ascend? But on a cloud. And here we see in Daniel, hundreds of years before this event takes place, I saw someone coming on a cloud like a son of man presented before the Ancient of Days, and to him was given dominion and authority and power over all the kingdoms of the earth this was looking forward to the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is ruling and reigning now. He has that authority right now. But now the question comes, why was he exalted to the right hand of God? Why was he given this honor and authority? Well, it wasn't for no reason. It was that all his enemies and God's enemies and your enemies and my enemies might be subdued. The author to the Hebrews goes on in Hebrews 10, verses 12 through 13. After the ascension, after the coronation, he writes this, he began waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. There's a sense in which everything right now is subject to Christ because he has this authority far above all authority and all rule. But there's also a sense in which he is waiting until his enemies are subdued under him. That's what it means that they be made a footstool for his feet. In, in the Old Testament, one of the symbolic ways that, that a, a victory was shown was they take the foreign king who had been conquered, put him on the ground, and the one who conquered him would put his foot on his neck. He was literally a footstool for his feet before, oftentimes, that king was killed. It showed that subjection. Well, the same thing is going to happen in the case of Christ. He is king, and all of his enemies are going to be subdued under his feet. Of course, that doesn't mean they're all going to be destroyed, but a number of them will, who do not bow the knee to Jesus and trust in him as Savior. Now, it's on the basis of this authority that's been given to Christ that all kings and all nations everywhere are called upon to submit to him. Now, not submit to him in, in a future judgment, but to submit to him right now. I'll read for you the very familiar Psalm 2. It talks about the nations as they resist uh, the fact that God wants to seat his son on his throne. They make an uproar and people's devising a vain thing and so forth and the leaders of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against his Messiah, but God laughs at them because he knows there's nothing they can do to stop it. But once his son is enthroned, once he is seated, we read this. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the son that he not become angry 
and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now again, the Lord here is speaking about the present time where there are kings who can submit to him. The book of Revelation uh, reveals the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who is ruling with a rod of iron and the one who smashes the nations as though they're made of earthenware. As you know, a, a terracotta pot has no chance against a rod of iron if one wields it against it and smash it to pieces. And that's exactly the kind of authority our Lord Jesus Christ wields. Again, this isn't speaking about the day of judgment. It's not talking about the world to come. It has to do with the present world and what God calls the nations to do right now because he is seated in the heavenlies right now. He is now ruling over the nations. His enemies are still, they still exist and they haven't yet been subdued. So that is what's going on right now. This is the work that began when the Lord Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of his Father. And it will be completed before he returns. The reason being is the last enemy that, it, that will be subjected to him is death, and that will be subdued, that will be conquered when he returns to raise all the dead. Now, wasn't this, this idea of the subjection of the nations, isn't this what he had in view when he commissioned the disciples and sent them out with the gospel? I mean, after he says that all authority had been given to him, he, he told them this in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What they were to bring about was the discipling or the subjection of the nations to him through the gospel. It wasn't a command to gather a few people from each country, but to make the nations his disciples. Actually, that's what the Greek language literally means, but it's not often the way we read it. And isn't this what we've already seen, what the Lord Jesus Christ actually commands us to pray for? When he tells us to pray in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 10, pray in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Basically, it's a prayer that everyone everywhere would fear God, would fear the Lord, that His kingdom would come with power and His will would actually be carried out on earth in the same way that it is done in heaven. I mean, our passage basically tells us that this prayer that Jesus is commanding us to pray is actually going to be answered. Paul writes, for He must reign until He has put all His enemies under his feet. And he also writes this in Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus basically tells us in the kingdom parables that his kingdom is going to grow, and it is going to become powerful, so powerful that the nations of the earth are actually going to seek for shelter under its, under its branches. That's what he has in mind where he talks about the parable of the mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now, I know there's a variety of interpretations on that particular parable, but I do believe that Jesus here draws upon Old Testament imagery, that of King Nebuchadnezzar's uh, uh, vision that he had of this great tree 
which was his kingdom that had branches that were stretching out over the earth and how the beasts of the field were, were seeking, as it were, you know, to be fed and taken care of by its fruitfulness, but the birds of the air were also nesting in its branches and the imagery there meant that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom had become so large and powerful that the nations of the earth were actually seeking refuge under its branches and that fits perfectly with what we're seeing that the Lord says will take place in Christ's kingdom. Now, another parable, that of the leaven, also indicates that his kingdom is going to permeate and its influence is going to fill the whole earth. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven begins small, it becomes large. Its influence is small, like leaven begins small, but it works its way through the whole lump until all the dough or the whole world is leavened by its influence. Now, Jesus is not saying here that the whole world is going to be saved because he also gives the parable of the wheat and the tares and how the wheat and the tares are growing together in the same field, which is the world, and they are to grow together until the end of the age when the harvest takes place, and then the angels are to gather up the tares and cast them into the fire, but the wheat is to be gathered into the barn. It's talking about the final judgment. There are going to be wheat and tares in the world throughout time until the very end. But I do want you to notice that they weren't supposed to pull up the tares because they might damage the wheat because the tares and the wheat are growing so closely together and because they look so similar. Did, did the Lord have in mind here the idea of the subjection of the world because they all in some way look like wheat? The only difference between the wheat and the tares is the fact that wheat bears fruit, but tares do not. And that's the only difference between a Christian and an unbeliever, is that a Christian bears fruit for God's glory, but the unbeliever does not. Even if he may look like a Christian, he doesn't bring any good fruit forth. Now, the psalmist writes this regarding Jesus' reign in Psalm 66, verses 3 and 4. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. We certainly haven't seen that come about on a worldwide scale. And yet our Lord tells us that that is what is going to happen. All the earth is going to worship him at a time when there are still enemies present and they will give feigned obedience to the Lord. Perhaps that's what's meant by the fact that they look like tares and they are not true wheat. So basically, Jesus is reigning now. All the nations will be discipled. His kingdom will come. His will will be done. Every knee shall bow. And they will either do this willingly because they love the Lord by His grace and trust in His Son, or they will do it not so willingly, out of fear. But the point is, everyone will. Now, you need to realize that uh, now is the day of grace, and those who willingly bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ are promised forgiveness and mercy and grace, the forgiveness of sins, and a perfect righteousness to cover, basically, our nakedness, because before the Lord, we're worse than naked. We're actually filthy and have guilt and sin that stains us, that pollutes us. But the Lord is willing to take away all of that imperfection and to clothe us with his robes of righteousness, if only we will trust him. So if you haven't trusted him, if you haven't willingly submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, do so now, and you will be saved. If you continue to fight against him, you need to realize you're going to lose. And eventually you will bow the knee, but you will bow at a time when it may be too late to save your soul. By the way, let's not miss the encouragement that this gives us with regard to evangelism. That the Lord Jesus is going to gather in his sheep. He is going to subdue his enemies. He is going to do it through the gospel. And that is his reward. That reward will be given to the Son. The sheep will be gathered. The enemies will be subject to him. Now, let's just consider this last point briefly, and that is this, that revival moves that work forward as well as that of gathering in the sheep. 
Revival, we've already seen, boosts the work of, of collecting, of gathering Christ's sheep as they are called by the gospel. But it also boosts the subjection of the unconverted. Revival promotes Christ's work, both as Savior and as Lord. Now, there are two things that take place in a revival, and that is awakening and conversion. During a revival, more people are converted than would be normally. More of Jesus' people are saved, more are gathered in. But even more people are awakened. Now, awakening is something that is short of conversion. It's something the Lord does by His Holy Spirit to heighten the conscience and strike fear in the hearts of people so that they will submit to the Lord. We saw a great example of this in Pilgrim's Progress the last time we met, the man who had the dream. He dreamed it was the day of judgment. He dreamed that the angels were sent out and they gathered together all the wheat and they were taken away, but he was left with the tares. He saw the pit of hell, the lake of fire open in front of him, and he saw the Lord staring at him, and his conscience was accusing him. And in the midst of this horrifying dream, he wakes up and he gets out of bed and he's trembling. And Christian says, why are you trembling? And he tells him his story. That man was awakened. You see, awakening is fear. It's when the Lord works on the conscience and he brings home the reality. When he breaks the illusion of the world, even if only for a few moments, and brings somebody face to face with reality. I've used that, that um, well, I've said that several times now. And I want you to realize that for, for many of us, most of the time we are living in, in an illusion. The things that we think are important, the things we go about day by day, if we don't have God's kingdom in mind, if we don't see eternity, if we don't see the day of judgment, if we don't see lost people around us, then we're blind. We are not awakened as we should be. When a person is awakened, that's when these things are brought home. That's when all these things that we think are important, we see not to be important, and we see the things that really are. That is the condition that we need to be in if we're going to reach the lost. That's the condition they need to be in before they're going to be open to hearing about the Savior. And that's something we're going to see this evening because it's that kind of witness, it's that kind of testimony, it's that kind of preaching that the Lord used to bring about these awakening. This kind of fear that, that the Spirit of God produces is what subdues sin. And when sin is subdued and people turn from their sins, even if it's for the wrong reasons, it actually brings about an obedience, a pretended submission. Remember how we read in the Psalms already that in the day of His power, even His enemies will give feigned obedience to Him. And even a feigned kind of obedience where people are actually doing what God calls them to do can bring about a, a, well, a time of prosperity, a time of physical blessings when people turn from what's wrong and begin to do what's right. One thing that uh, John Gerstner used to say was that if a person was awakened and he happened to make mouse traps, he'll make the best mouse traps in all of New England and people will come from everywhere to buy his mouse traps because he's dealing honestly, because he's making a good product, because he's doing what he should be doing, loving his neighbor as he loves himself and wanting to give them something that's good rather than something cheap that he can just make a lot of money on. It will bring about prosperity for everyone in situations like this. Now, that's not the only reason, of course, we pray for revival, but it's certainly one of the reasons why we should be praying for it. And so here... We need to seek for revival. You need to seek revival so that you and all of the Lord's church will have the power that you need to go out and gather His people, that you might have basically the illusion that, that you're living under shattered so you can see reality and see the, the importance of doing this. When we see the people around us, we, we typically don't think that they're going to die. But you know what? They die, don't they? And when they've died, we think, you know what? I should have talked to that person, but I didn't. And now they're dead. But if we had seen that before, we might have done something about it before. That's one of the illusions that has to be shattered, is that we do, in fact, live in a world of death. And everyone around us is not certain of living even one more day. Neither are we. 
which is why we need to be ready. But revival is something that will bring this out, help us to see. By the way, it doesn't have to be a worldwide revival for that to happen. You just need to use the means of grace to revive your own hearts and be filled with the Spirit so that you can see it and then become a means of reviving other people, your brothers and sisters and those who are outside the church. You need to pray for revival so that the kingdom of heaven also may gain ground, that the unconverted would fear and turn to the Lord, and that the Lord might take back the territory that was taken from him through Adam, when Adam basically handed the world over to Satan. We need to seek it that the nations might experience the Lord's blessings. Again, I think in Psalm 72, we have some uh, examples of, of the psalmist looking forward to what things are going to be like under the reign of the Messiah and the blessings that this subjection of his enemies was actually going to bring about. He says this, Solomon wrote this, in his days may the righteous flourish and abundance of peace till the moon is no more. May he also rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Let all kings bow down before him. All nations serve him, for he will deliver the needy when he cries for help. The afflicted also in him who has no helper. He will have compassion on the poor and needy, and the lives of the needy he will save. He will rescue their life from oppression and violence, and their blood will be precious in his sight. May there be abundance of grain in the earth on top of the mountains, its fruit will wave like the cedars of Lebanon. And may those from the city flourish like vegetation of the earth. May his name endure forever. May his name increase as long as the sun shines. And may men bless themselves by him. All nations call him blessed. Again, look at the benevolent rule of the Lord Jesus Christ and the one that all the kings of the earth are called upon to submit to. Does it look to you like the Lord Jesus is a tyrant and someone who's going to make life miserable and difficult for everyone in the world? No, the reason why they are to submit to him is because he is good and gracious and everything he desires for the world is good and his reign is a reign of blessing and it brings blessing. And that's why we ought to desire it. The Bible says Jesus is king, and one day every knee will bow to him, but it's not going to come about except through the means, the word of God and the spirit of God. And so there's two things that you and I need to do. We need to take the word of God to other people. We need to evangelize. People aren't going to be awakened, and they're not going to turn. They're not going to be saved unless they hear the gospel. But we also need to pray. We need to pray that God would send His Holy Spirit because no one is going to be converted apart from the Spirit of God. No one is going to be truly awakened in the sense that they'll seek after the Lord apart from the Spirit's work. We need to pray that the Lord would send His Spirit and subdue His enemies either by converting them or by striking fear in their hearts and that he would take back the world. But again, remember, he's only going to do it through you and through me. So unless we're willing to be a part of the equation, God is not going to answer that prayer. We have to be willing to do something. It doesn't happen in a vacuum apart from God's people. So may the Lord give us the grace then to seek him to advance his kingdom. And may he help us also to do what he calls us to do. Again, our purpose in life should be to advance the kingdom because that's what God made us to do. So may God grant that each of us would advance the kingdom in every single thing that we do to seek to give him glory and honor and praise. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to remember everything we've just seen, to apply it to our lives, to ask him what is it that you want me to do, Lord, particularly? Let, let's, let's spend a few moments in silent prayer.